Hi, everybody. We'll just take another minute and let everyone kind of saunter in. I wish we had some music. <laughs> Brian, I'm just saying, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, no, no. It would just walk off immediately. Just... <laughs> all right, all right. Let's get started. Um, I'm Liz Hoddle. I'm the Director of Events and Marketing at Politics and Prose. And I'm so pleased to welcome Brian Washington and Chris Narnett to PNP Live. Um, it has been a very strange week, and this is a wonderful, wonderful bright spot. So welcome. At any time, you can add joy and congratulations tonight to the chat. But if you have questions, please put them down at the bottom of the screen where you can see the little Q&A button, and we'll go through as many as we can. You can also click on the link, which we'll put in to purchase either Memorial or Mostly Dead Things on PNP's website. Um, thank you to the couple of you that donated or bought books already, and a reminder to everyone watching that um, our programming is in jeopardy, and we need to see book sales from these events, um, otherwise we can't keep doing them. If you appreciate what we do and want us to be able to keep doing it, just buy a damn book. Um, I can urge you to buy a damn book with a very clear conscience and clear heart tonight, um, because Memorial is just so wonderfully good. Um, I just like to say that what's amazing to me about this book, um, about Memorial. So in Lot, Brian's debut story collection, it um, like vibrated and sizzled with lyricism and longing and it like jumped off the page. And in Memorial, Brian found a way to sink all of that intensity under the surface and replaced it with this space and kind of quiet between the main quartet of characters. Brian has taken all this feeling and language power and inverted it onto the stillness of these relationships um, and under the kind of the stillness of the book itself. And it's really, really an awesome achievement. Um, we're so lucky to have Brian here tonight and he will be in conversation with the dazzling Kristen Arnett, whose own kind of unique truth telling in her debut novel is as singular and as unbeholden as Brian's. Please help me welcome Brian and Kristen to PNP Live. Hey. Oh, hey. I'm so hey guys, happy thanks. to be here. Um, I was thrilled to um, find out that I would get to talk with you about this book. I am obsessed with your work. I was no. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, because um, when I read Lot, um, I was on a plane, I think I was flying somewhere and I had it in my bag and I pulled it out and I was so engrossed in your, like, cause you write about place in this way that's like so near and dear to my heart. This like way that's like very messy and very like loving, but then also very like willing to like dig into like, just like the stuff that's like not as nice. Um, and so like, I was like, right off the bat, I'm just gonna have to ask you just cause like, I have a laundry list of questions to ask you that we won't even get to half of them. But um, I just want, if you wouldn't mind, um, just talking about like your, your idea of writing place. So specifically Houston, but like what that meant to you like in writing Memorial, this very beautiful, I was like, oh my god that it's like a debut novel and it's like written in this like just like masterful beautiful way but like if you can talk about writing place in memorial that would just like thrill my heart <laughs> oh my god okay i can i can try to talk about it i mean as someone who does it as well as yourself i feel like i'm just going to be speaking <laughs> into like someone already knows you know but i can try really briefly many thanks to paul and pros for having as many thanks to liz for the introduction and many thanks to beth for handling all of the tech wizardry that allows us to get to talk across the space and time but as far as like place is concerned i think that for memorial what was really important to me was trying to capture the warmth that i'd been really privileged to experience in both Houston and also Osaka. And because they're visibly, I suppose I get first glance, like very different cities from one another. The fact that they shared that warmth, a warmth that felt like really singular and one that felt really palpable to me in the time that I'd spent in both places. 
that connection between the two felt like a story in and of itself. And the question on my end became like, what is that story? And once I had the sort of characters in mind to navigate the narrative, the question then became how do you know these folks think of themselves within their respective contexts in these cities and how do the folks around them think of them and how does that differ from who they ultimately want to become right that, that i suppose those felt like three different and distinct identities to me right like how we feel ourselves like who we feel we are who the folks around us think of us as and who we ultimately want to become and what happens when we're no longer told in a lot of ways who we need to be or how we need to be so giving the characters the freedom to explore not only themselves but also their surroundings to see how those surroundings change them was really important to me when I thought about the role that the cities played in the narrative and also like the role that cities can play in a narrative generally I mean I think it helps that I actually quite like Houston, like I found a way to monetize it. So it might seem like it's just like a fucking shit bag, right? <laughs> about Houston, but like I actually do like like the city. So the, I, I imagine that can only help, you know, my case when it comes to, to writing about it, but really trying to make that warmth tangible that, you know, that I'd seen that I'd been experiencing was really important to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you can feel it. And now that I got you to answer like a very deep personal question, I would love it if you would read. Okay. <laughs> I was so excited. I wanted to, I just, I no. was thrilled to ask you about place. No. Yeah, I would, I would be thrilled to death if I could hear you read from your book. And I think everybody okay. would agree with that, so. Okay, yeah. So I'll read um, a little bit from the very beginning of the novel. It is the beginning of the novel, so you don't need to know a damn thing, except that maybe the novel is called Memorial, yeah? Uh, Mike's taking off for Osaka, but his mother's flying into Houston. Just for a few weeks, he says. Or maybe a couple of months, he says. But I need to go. The first thing I think is, fuck. The second is that we don't have the money for this. Then it occurs to me that we don't have any savings at all. But Mike's always good about separating his finances, always cool about moving his checks. It's something I'd always taken for granted about it. Now he's saying that he wants to find his father. The man's gotten sick. Mike wants to catch him before he goes. And I'm on the sofa, half listening, half charging my phone. You haven't seen your mom in years, I say. She's coming here for you. I've never even met her. I say, you don't even fucking like your dad. And that's when Mike says, true, but I already bought the ticket. And Ma will be here when I'm back. Be great company. She'll live. So now Mike's cracking eggs by the stove, slipping yolks into a pair of pans after they've settled. He salts them, drizzling mayonnaise with a few sprigs of oregano. And Mike used to have this thing about sriracha. He'd pull a fucking hernia whenever I reached for it. But now he squeezes a faded bottle over my omelet, rubbing it in with a spatula. I don't ask where he'll stay in Japan. I don't ask who he'll stay with. I don't ask where his mother will sleep here in our one bedroom apartment or exactly what that arrangement will look like. The thing about a moving train is that sometimes you can catch it. Some of the kids I work with, that's how their families make it into this country. If you fall, you're dead. If you're too slow, you're dead. But if you get a running start, it's never entirely gone. So I don't flip the coffee table or one of the chairs. I don't key Mike's car or ram it straight through the living room. After the black eye, we stopped putting our hands on each other because we both figured silently this was the least we could do. So today, what I do is smile. I thank Mike for letting me know. I ask him when he's leaving and I know that's my mistake. I'm already reaching to toss my charger before he says it, tomorrow. We've been fine. Thank you for asking. Yay! <laughs> oh, it's so good to actually, oh, it's so good to hear you read it. Because like even like reading um, Memorial and even like the stories and lot, you have like such, and, and your essay work and all of your like, oh. writing, even your tweets, bless you. Oh. Um, you have such a like a specific like voice that you can like 
I could like hear in the page, just like in my head as I like read along and hearing you read it sounds like that, like really, like you give it like this very specific voice to it. And so I was thrilled to be able to hear it. I'm sure like everybody else in oh, here. Thank you. Well, yeah, but... no, that's all fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, a thing also that I'm really glad that you read from the opening. I mean, cause first of all, it's just, it's such a great opening. Uh, but there's a thing about this book and in a lot of your writing that I think um, as a person who like very much um, values humor and finding the funny in things and maybe when they're not supposed to necessarily be funny there's a lot of funny in this book that uh like just like even like um the, just the the scene that you end on we're fine thanks for asking or like the idea of like this kind of like specific kind of comedy and situation also like later on in the book like the scenes at the bar like the like the interaction of those characters that are there this is like funny shit I was like this is like very funny um did, when you were writing the book did you like think at all about like the kind of insertion of humor or comedy or this kind of like way that you put it in on the line or like between characters yeah I'm gonna add Kristen Arnett said that I wrote funny shit to my CV and I'm going to send it out <laughs> everywhere I've ever applied because that is how <laughs> they could be on hearing that for me. I mean, like one of the top 10 funniest people on this planet right now. <laughs> but yes, um, you, you know, humor is, I don't know, it's funny. Like, I feel like it makes the story move brisker and I also think that it makes the trickier bits of the narrative or the more challenging moments that Ben and Mike and Mitsuko and Eju and Ben's family navigate more navigable. The fact that they're able to laugh about it or the fact that they're able to find a pocket of humor within the scenes that they're sort of traversing from moment to moment. And I think that what felt like the trick of it for Memorial is identifying like what was funny to each of the characters and why it was funny to them and how their respective senses of humors allowed them to connect with one another. I think it was really important to me to sort of codify that while Mitsuko and Eiju may have been a separated couple, that their senses of humor were such that one could easily see why they were together and how they could have blended together. And the same was true for me when it came to Ben and Mike and that in a lot of ways, Mike is a bit harder in spots and Ben is a bit softer in spots. And yet their sense of, senses of humor are the inverse of that in a lot of ways. And so they're able to connect in corners of their lives that otherwise it'd be quite difficult for them to match one another. So trying to imbue the narrative like with moments of levity made it a more enjoyable process for me as far as like writing was concerned but also trying to be open to this notion that you can have characters and particularly characters from marginalized backgrounds or queer characters more mm -hmm. specifically that are undergoing a number of difficult things in a story without it being a difficult story to read or characters that are navigating the sort of residue of trauma that they may have experienced without it being a traumatic story or a story that solely traffics in trauma as like an emotional mm -hmm. pocket. So trying to find where a joke could fit and then inverting that joke and moving it into a place that feels unexpected felt like a necessary thing for much of the book. Yeah, the mechanics of humor. <laughs> yeah like that but like, it's just, like i don't know like i feel like talking about joke is, is like the least sexy thing but it's, no, like, there's nothing it's, less think, funny than talking about like, the timing of, of no, humor. But, i feel like it's so yeah it's i so think it's really so true though i love the idea of like right like what's like the inverse of like how does humor work especially like within relationships like not only within like partners like romantic partners but like within a family right yes. like like the or like with uh friends or co-workers right there's this like kind of set language that's like set between like in those relationships that's embedded like uh yes. not like necessarily like inside jokes but like the the history or the memory that kind of fits with things so like how humor works in those situations versus like right like benson and mitsuko like being together like they don't have any kind of frame of history or reference but like so how does like the humor fit in with that like getting to know somebody and then also developing 
like the language to develop like the kind of like patter that would be humorous. So yes, I like the mechanics. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> um, like speaking of mechanics, like this is like, um, you still have such a like a, I always say this thing, and I'm gonna say it really weird, which sounds like a very me thing to say, but <laughs> like, I love reading anything and being able to like, like be like, oh, this is Brian. I can, I can hear, I can read this piece of work without even seeing who it's by and know that it's you because I can hear your voice in it. And like Lot does this and definitely so does Memorial. I sat down like from page one, I was like, I can feel you in it. And I hadn't even met you in person, but I was like, I can feel you in it as a writer. It has these like kind of very specific Brian things that felt so significant and are like, wow, so enjoyable. But like, were you, like when you sat down to write this book, was this like always a novel for you? Because like your short fiction is just so fucking great. Um, was this like something that like when, like you were like, I'm gonna sit down and write a novel or was this something that started from a genesis of something else? Like an idea that was maybe like a short story or something like that. Like what was like the process of like creating this novel from like a short fiction writer? Of course. And like, again, as someone who's voice feels like so strong and so like codified like hearing that from you I'm talking about you like this is like this is not me that I'm talking about anymore like you know this is about you like to hear that like it's really you know, it's really lovely so you know thank you um it was originally memorial was originally a short story it was um less than 3,000 words but more than 1,500 and I wrote it for oh, free shit. for a friend scene yeah I wrote it for free for a friend scene um and it was fun to do it did it in a weekend and sent it and then it was in the zine um, I was in the midst of writing what I thought would be the follow-up to Lot and it wasn't going well because I fucking hated it and it was like the sort of book that I thought that like oh like this is like this is what I should do like this is what I should do um, but you know it wasn't what I should have been doing because I wasn't interested in it and it was a tangible disinterest but in the midst of writing and failing with that project I would think about the characters in Memorial and I would think about the structural concerns and also the thematic concerns like these questions of identity and these questions of home and these questions of place because it was really fascinating to me that a character like Mike who's just this queer Japanese American cis bro living in Third Ward which is one of the country's oldest black neighborhoods can think of himself as a product of that neighborhood and to actually be a product of that neighborhood and have a symbiotic relationship with the folks within that neighborhood like a narrative in which that can be true and where it could also be true that Benson his partner finds the closest of iteration of home that he's privy to and this significantly older Japanese woman like Mitsuko, Mike's mother, like trying to write a narrative in which multiple things could be true simultaneously felt like a question that I didn't have an answer to. But I think that the difference between short fiction and longer projects for me, as far as like sustainability is concerned, is that there's always like some sort of question that I would like to tackle, not necessarily answering. And I think that for a lot, the questions that I had throughout the book could sustain the weight of 1500 words, or they could sustain the weight of 3000 words, or in one case, the weight of 12,000 odd words. And that was the max amount of, I suppose, time that I needed to spend with that question. Whereas for a memorial, the questions of what is home for someone or what is family for someone or at what point is a partner your partner or no longer your partner or at what point is a platonic relationship a romantic relationship and perhaps what happens when there are multiple partners like which is which and who needs to move be moved where and like what happens when like the thing that a character is told is the good thing is not the good thing for that character you know like what if the bad thing is actually the good thing for someone and they have to reevaluate how they see not only themselves, but the context in which they exist. Like those felt like questions that could withstand the length of a novel. And they were questions that didn't, you know, fucking bore me over the course of, you know, <laughs> however many words memorial is, I don't know, 60,000 words, right? So trying to find questions that I know I won't answer, but that I think could sustain the 
amount of time that I would be working on them um, was a key difference. Yeah. Well, no, I love that because I think the work that's like always the most interesting and no matter like what, like genre wise is work that's like not an answer, but like a question that like maybe begets more questions. Um, Something that's going to be like an ongoing conversation versus like a means to an end because so yes. often too, I feel like an answer isn't an answer. It's an answer in that yes. in that moment in time, right? It's like the idea of saying like, oh, I definitely know what I think about this thing because then like, right, like maybe like three days later, like, what do you think about that same thing? Like, exactly. That's the passage just like that. Time. Yeah. It's like, I, th- I think it's really fascinating to hear you talk about like the, sh- the structure, like, or what, what, uh, what something can hold. Cause so often I think about uh, short fiction as like, I think of it in my head. Cause I think about things in shapes. I think about it as a snow globe um, and like oh. what it can contain. Like, like, you know, the, the short story is like inside the snow globe. Like it's a captured moment and it like fits neatly inside of it. And that's like how to myself, I can see the image and like the moment caught in time inside the snow globe. And that's like, the shape that um, that short fiction often feels like for me, whereas novels feel like different kinds of shapes because they are like, they, they contain so much, but it's like, not like answers. It's like this kind of sprawling, like kind of question on question on question with like, not like necessarily an, like any kind of answer. And it, maybe it's asking yeah. the, the reader, whoever the reader is to kind of like whatever their particular answer is to it or their question, yeah. yeah. That exact thing, like trying to write a, and I, and I feel like mostly dead things like just does this like so deftly, like trying to write a narrative in which the reader can occupy it, right? Like, and the, the they have to provide that answer given their respective, you know, rural decks of life experiences and their respective literary canons that they're bringing to your text. And the fact that, you know, you yourself and your novel and, you know, authors, I suppose more generally are able to create a space for readers to occupy that feels just like a really special thing and a gift in a lot of ways to get to like be outside of yourself for a little while and that was certainly like for memorial was on the forefront of things that i wanted to do like i wasn't interested in writing a book that would be prescriptive or a book in which someone would learn something tangible about how to navigate their <laughs> relationships like i don't like I, I yeah like i don't think that you know you're gonna read memorial i don't think okay this is what I need to tell my partner in order for them to come back to me. Like that's yeah. this memorial is not the book to do that. But I wasn't really interested in writing that book so much as writing a narrative about people who were allowed to make the mistakes that they made and then to attempt to rebound from them. And also like I wanted to write a narrative in which the characters were interacting with one another from a place of love mm-hmm. to where that wasn't a question, right? I didn't want it to be a question of like, okay, does Mike love that or does Ben love Mike? Like from the outside, I just wanted that to be yes. But the language, I suppose, that they use to communicate that love and the ways in which those misconnections that they have with one another become more indicative of the relationship than the love itself. And perhaps what happens when that love takes a form that isn't recognizable by the other party and it becomes a sort of transaction, right? Like who is willing to give up what within that relationship, like between Ben and his father and his father is someone who loves his son, but his language, as far as his son's queerness wouldn't immediately belie that. And yet Ben is able to see who his father for who he is and see his language for who he is. And so there's a concession that's made. And I didn't want to cast judgment on that concession so much as just to put it there on the page and allow the reader to take it and do, you know, what they would with it. But really trying to write a narrative that operated outside the binaries because I don't think that we ourselves operate within binaries especially in a moment when like now when so many things can be true simultaneously and so many things that we thought to be true are no longer true or have revealed themselves to more people to not be true it felt especially important not to cast anyone as good or bad in the novel yeah I mean I think that there's just like a lot of like empathy like uh like sitting inside of this like 
this text like between the characters, but also like like just like within the, the the narrative as a whole. And like this idea of like different kinds of intimacy and like what like love can like look like in different kinds of capacities, right? Like I think like not wanting things to be in a binary is like a really great way to think about this because there are so many different people and so many different kinds of relationships and so many different kinds of problems, um, but also like not necessarily, maybe problems isn't even the word I want to use, but like something that feels like, like a, like a miscommunication or just this kind of like, Danielle Evans was talking about this the other day. She said it as this way where it's like, not the problem in the story, but like, there's like, you can see kind of where something's going, but like at, like to have some place in the text where like the characters have choices and they make a choice that ultimately leads yes. towards like whatever, right? But like to have them have that moment where they could make another choice or many different other kinds of choices. So to show them do this kind of thing kind of puts in this, I think there's like, um, as, a, as a reader of this particular like book, it, for like example, like seeing that, like I was like, I have empathy for this because it's like a very yeah. human thing to be like, you know, here's where I am in my life and I'm making this specific choice. Like I'm, I'm here with you and we were making this specific choice. And it's like, I thought it was fascinating to like see the different levels of like where intimacy can lie and how it can develop in other people and how sometimes it changes, right? Like when you were writing, like, cause I think it's like a love story, but like, what is like, you know, love means a lot of different things, mm -hmm. right? So like when you were writing it, like I wanted to ask too, like maybe this is like a multi-part question, but did you see it as being like a back and forth between like Benson and Mike? Like you saw, did you see the shape of it being like, I'm gonna allow these different perspectives like from right up front. Um, and also like, was it, when you were writing it, were you mindful of the fact that like, I was so impressed with this cause I'm obsessed with thinking about memory and the idea of like a memory being like, a memory is like only like one person's like particular mm -hmm. experience. It doesn't include someone else's like narrative of it but it's also like a memory of like, just like the last time you remembered the memory. But like, there's something so fascinating about reading these two characters and seeing like their particular takes on their relationship and how they each view it. And it's not necessarily this idea of like unreliable narrator because I think like literally everyone on the planet is an unreliable oh. narrator. Yeah, that's, that's the exact thing, yeah. <laughs> so when you were hearing it, were you like thinking a lot about like what it means to like, cause you kind of said this earlier too when you were talking about like, the inverse of humor, like this is who this person is and this is who this person is. So what does it look like to like flip to think about like their perspective versus the other person's perspective in a relationship? So writing that, I, again, did you like, were you, did you upfront think that you were gonna like see like both different perspectives of Mike and Benson? Yeah, a, a quick I think addendum that I'll add is that Danielle Evans's latest collection dropped earlier this week, today's Thursday. So it must've been released on Tuesday. You should get it because it's super brilliant. Oh, it's so good. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's so good. It's too good even. Uh, I think that from the outset, there were three things that I knew would have to occur within the novel. And the first was that Mitsuko would be in a lot of ways, the emotional center of the novel and that then and Mike would also be components of that sort of triage that they form. I knew that the novel would take place between Houston and Osaka, although I didn't know what capacity that would ultimately yield. And I also knew that I wanted to give as much credence to both Ben and Mike in, congr in Congress with one another, like their stories together as possible. I ultimately ended up settling on having Ben's narrative end up with about a thousand words more than Mike's narrative. Like I wanted it to get it, you know, one to one. And, you know, if I were good enough to do that, I would have done that. But it was really important to me, I think, that if I wanted to tell, you know, what is in a lot of ways a love story, although like, as you said, like a love story, could look, that, that tells you something without really telling you anything. Like saying something is a love story is like a really great marketing thing, but like, what does that actually tell you? Because there's so yeah. many different forms <laughs> of love, right? Like there's, in, it can take so many different turns until it looks deeply unrecognizable in a lot of ways. Like I was watching this, I've been watching this show called like Greenleaf, which is essentially like a K-drama set in Memphis. But like one of the leads was talking about like the, her marriage, like the her partner and like she's been on this tangent about how like marriage can take 
so many, or a relationship more generally can take so many different terms until it looks almost unrecognizable or entirely unrecognizable from the thing that it was wrought from. And I knew that the relationship between Mike and Ben from the outset would look unrecognizable from where they ultimately ended up for each of them for various reasons. And in order for that journey to take place, in order for that journey to make sense, it felt as if though I needed each of them to have space, to have not only their singular voices, but also their singular recollections of the events as they occurred on the page. So there are quite a few moments that we get from Ben's perspective and we also get from Mike's perspective, the, the actual moment itself. And then there are other moments that Ben only recalls or moments that Mike only recalls. And I think that felt true to life and that there are some moments that one partner can dwell in and think about and occupy because they are a certain way and others uh, they'll perhaps shrug off and others that they don't want anything to do with. And for Ben, who in a lot of ways is not quite as hard as Mike is, he's able to settle into the silences of their relationship and to settle into the sort of quiet moments and to sort of lean into what those quiet moments mean. Whereas Mike at the novel's outset anyway, is completely averse to the idea of that because silence is scary in a lot of ways, because it is, because it's, you have to put something in it um, or if nothing is in it, um, you have to look in it, which could be a terrifying thing. And I think it is terrifying for Mike at the novel's outset, but whereas Mike is able to spend time in his recollections and some of the more difficult conversations and some of the more volatile exchanges that they have with one another, and then isn't quite able to do that at the novel's outset. And I think there's a reading of the book that I was working toward in which Benson is ultimately someone who learns how to speak up for himself over the course of the book. And I wanted to mirror that in how the text actually looked in his initial parts, some chapters, or I've been calling them chapters. They're not chapters, but I've been calling them chapters because that makes it easier. Uh, they'll do like a sentence or there'll be like a graph or there'll be like two graphs and that'll be it. And as the narrative progresses, he'll talk a bit longer. He'll become a bit more elaborative. He'll build larger portraits of the things that he's trying to paint for the person he's speaking to. Whereas for Mike, at the beginning of his section, he just won't shut the fuck up. Like he just talks and talks and talks, just like eight pages at one point of just like talking ceaselessly. And <laughs> as his narrative, progresses there are more gaps of silence mm -hmm. and there's more white space on the page yes partly because he's listening more and partly because he's using the silence from his end in order to intuit the wants and desires and needs of those around him so really trying to find a way to show the arc of each of these characters and to show the change that they underwent felt immediately important to me from the very outset of the project, although it took quite a lot of drafting to figure out what that would ultimately look like and certainly to get it to a place where I felt as if though I myself knew those characters because much of my actually writing the book was learning new things about them and they interested me enough and they interest me enough to want to learn new things about them in the midst of that writing and spending time in their respective worlds. Yeah, that's, I really, yes. I, cause I think you can see it. You can watch it as it goes. Like, I love this idea of like the visual, like on the page, like seeing like the space and the moments like a break and like, like taking a uh, mic section, like, like, okay, learning to take like a beat and like making yourself sit with something, which is di very difficult to do. It's, like, it's, it's a hard thing to do. I definitely understand that. It's so, like an active thing to do, like to make yourself do. Like, you yeah. Know, I, I just like that. I also like that, like this, the idea that like partners, like certain moments, like have like significance to one and like an another person, like would have like, no, it has no significance to them because like, even though you're in a relationship, ultimately you're like a, a single individual. And so like how you fit within that relationship means like how you view things within it as your own personal kind of lens of it. Um, I, I think a great example of that is the idea of looking at the texts that happen between them. 
when they're apart, which is their like basic, like only form of communication that they have with each other. And it's like very frustrating communication um, with each other at, at points. Like, right, like Mike is oftentimes thinking, well, I'm gonna send this like, right, there's like, I'm gonna send images cause I don't really know what to say. Um, and we're not communicating in a way that's helpful or I feel like, or like, I feel like maybe this is the only way I can say this to you. And I was like, that is like so, deeply human and very messy to think about the ways in which like we care deeply for other people but have such struggles communicating it. So um, like when you when you were thinking about those texts were you thinking like about like the idea of like how fucking hard it is to communicate to another person? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it's like frustrating, you know, to like be texting someone whether or not it's in a romantic capacity or like a platonic capacity and like you're in that conversation and you like ask a question and then you see like if, if you have, you know, and I don't, I don't know if Android phones do this. If you have like those sort of like those three dots that ellipses yes. and then they disappear and they have them reappear and they sort of have them disappear again. <laughs> Um, you know, there's a lot of tension in that moment, and yet it's a, you know it's a tiny capsule of a moment, but it's a you know it's a massive frustration. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, I wanted to write a novel about communication, and I wanted to write a novel about connection, and the ways in which people, whether they're in a romantic context or a platonic context, communicate and connect, and perhaps also what avenues they turn to when language fails them, whether for a literal mistranslation, whether for a metaphorical mistranslation or sort of misconnection. And in the case of Mike and Ben, oftentimes, although they want to connect with one another and all they do, although they do love one another and there will be that moment of hesitancy for both of them when they know that, okay, I should probably fill the silence with something or I should probably fill the void in this moment or the, I don't know, the, the, the crease after a more challenging moment between them with something warm, but not having the language to do that. And so, you know, they turn to texts and they turn to photos, they turn to physicality with one another, they turn to cooking for one another as a vehicle to impart that comfort and that warmth to one another. And in a lot of ways, I think it was really interesting to me and something that's still interesting to me in capacities outside of Memorial and also within it are the ways in which the characters love languages can so impact the way that they communicate with those around them, right? And I'm someone who felt it was deeply important. I generally feel it's deeply important to figure out like what my characters love languages are, like how they conceive of love, how they intuit the value that the love that they have to give can tangibly be felt by the folks around them, whether romantic or platonic. And for Ben and Mike, as long as they've been together, they don't quite know what the other needs. Yeah. They have a sense of what the other wants right. and they have a sense of what works as far as like what they've given them in the past. But the question of like what they respectively need is a bit veiled and it's not entirely their fault because they themselves don't know what yeah. mm -hmm. they need and much of and that feels like really true to life you know like not being able to articulate like a specific desire until a certain amount of distance has passed and then it becomes you know crystal clear like two years down the road or even a week down the road right like knowing that this is what I should have responded to the text or this is what I should have set up for this argument and so on without necessarily seeing that in the midst of the moment. So trying to take the sort of pockets of this connection between the two of them and between every character and allow the characters to stick with those and give them a choice and also the ability to contort them into moments of connection the next yeah. time that they come around was really important to me because I wanted it to be possible for characters to rebound from those moments. I didn't want the novel to be a series of ultimatums or judgments based on characters' ability or inability to make things work with those around them. It felt really important to me for tiny 
moments, whether it's a hug, whether it's a shared glance, whether it's like a sort of quick, quippy conversation to have a lot of value, to have like a lot of warmth and a lot of weight and for it to be not instructive, but like constructive for that particular character and their route to figuring out what they want, what they need, what they desire, and what the folks around them want, need, desire, and whether or not they can sort of bridge that gap with the tools that they have on hand, or if they need new tools in order to do that, which I think is a question that that it might find themselves navigating over the course of the book. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, there's definitely these ways in which like, um you can see them like struggling to figure out like what it is, but but so much of that is, is like another deeply human thing is like, right? You said like so often, like we don't know, like need and want, but like, it's really hard to express what it is that you need when you you yourself don't know. Yeah. So it's like, it's definitely there. And it's like, it like creates a lot of empathy because you're like, you know that this person is like, like deeply wanting something specific and they don't have the, the ability, at least in that moment or with this, particular person and that doesn't necessarily even mean like between Mike and Benson it can be like yeah. between Benson and his family or like what do I need from my family and I'm not able to articulate it um, um or Mike and his father like what do I need from this person and I'm not able to articulate it um there's so many questions I have to ask you I know that everybody else is wanting to ask questions but I'm gonna ask one more before I'm gonna okay I'm gonna ask one more before I let you uh, yeah. other questions um this book is so um, physically bodied and I am a person who loves that. Like, right, like there's like characters who like not only like in their like relationships are like messy and like unable to understand what they want but like physically it's very bodied. And so much of this is like done through, right? You write so beautifully about food. Um, everybody has to tell you this all the time but it's like, it's this also like beautiful physical connector between people in the book. And also like the way that you write queer sex between people is like messy and very real. And oftentimes it's like, I don't know how to communicate my needs and wants with you, but I know how to communicate with through this. I know how to, we can mm. fuck and I can communicate like some of what I'm feeling through this moment because I'm unable to articulate it through words. So like in writing the book, like I'd love it if you talk about just like writing the bodies in there. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. No, no, it makes, it makes so much sense. And I so admire the way that you do this. So, you know, getting to talk about it with you is like really lovely. Um, it was important to me to have like a diversity of bodies and it was really important to me to have a diversity of physicality. And it was important to me because coming back to this idea of like comfort and pleasure was really important to me in a number of capacities, but particularly through the sex that the characters have. And it, I think, says and said a good deal about each of the characters that sex was something that they sought to turn toward and not only sex generally, but the kind of sex that they have with one another, like whether it's hastily enacted or whether it takes quite a long time or they're lingering with one another or who allows who into their bodies and also why and also when and what it meant, even in some instances like between Mike and Tan, when the sort of satisfaction that Mike may have expected or wanted from sex revealed itself in an act that was deeply physical, but that wasn't yeah. sex. And what that had to say about Mike's specific needs as opposed to what he'd been led to think that he wanted. Right? Like if an act of physicality that isn't necessarily fucking yields and result that is more pleasurable than that of the fucking itself then what role does like the fucking have like in a character's yeah sort of conceptions not only of themselves but also as far as their desires are concerned and also for a character like Benson who has navigated a good deal of trauma around the act of sex and of physicality to allow someone in and around his body feels like a major concession and a major act of trust. And trying to see what it means for these characters to repeatedly make these acts of trust that they, and it is like an act of trust. Like there's not really, there's never, I don't think in 
an act of Congress that occurs in Memorial, a scenario in which a character just sort of knows that their partner is going to be receptive to all of their wants and desires. And much of the novel and much of my writing in their fucking in the novel was their attempting to be able to articulate their desires and to recognize their needs and their desires and also to find ways to show their partners that this is what they in fact want while simultaneously giving those partners, whether it's Mike, whether it's Ben, whether it's Omar, whether it's Tam, the space to have acceptance and to show their acceptance and the chance for them to be dynamic as far as like what acceptance could look like and as far as what comforting their partner could look like. So allowing the characters to fuck up in the midst of fucking and come back and find a way to make it work and in a way that was mutually beneficial for all parties involved was really important to me because I think there's a way of writing about sex and queer narrative specifically in which it's solely a traumatic event or it's occurring in a way in which the reader is meant to learn something, right? Or rather to learn not to do something. Yeah. And I wanted the characters to have pleasure and to be able to articulate that they have pleasure and also to get it. So trying to find ways for the characters not only to articulate that pleasure, but to give pleasure to the folks that they're in Congress with felt and feels deeply important. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I think it also goes into what you're saying about like kind of developing like a warmth throughout this, like the, the, the different kinds of intimacies, which includes like bodied intimacy, like fucking and sex. Like what is that? Or like not sex, like you're talking about um, in moments of like, deep closeness um, yes. it's be it's beautiful to, to read it and also see just like the shift and yeah. morphology but okay I will uh I will ask you the actual questions now that yeah. are that are here since uh, I can't I can't continue to ask my like laundry list <laughs> oh, no. okay. all night but um okay Okay, this is a good one because I also want to ask you about cooking. Um, Susie asks, I love the way you wrote about food and cooking, especially how Mike and Benson relate to food and cooking differently. Can you talk about what role food played in the book for you? Hi, Susie. Um, so there's a reading of the book where Ben is ultimately someone who learns how to convey what he wants through the act of creating a meal. Mike is someone who ultimately become someone who's able to intuit the desires of those around him through what he creates as a meal. And the sort of through line between them is Mitsuka's cooking and that she's the one character who is constantly creating an even keel for those around her and is constantly creating a sort of foundation of comfort for those around her. And oftentimes she's doing it through the food that she prepares. And I think, you know, it says a good deal about a person, but also like a character when she flies from Tokyo to Houston, a city that she lived in for a time, had a really rough go in to see her son who immediately leaves to go see his estranged father and also leaves her with his baby partner with no real explanation, justification or sense of when he'll be returning. And the first thing that Mitsuko does is cook a meal you know, she provides comfort to Ben. And that is the bedrock of their relationship going forward, even at its most difficult moments. She's constantly finding ways to bring everyone back to that sort of even moment and trying to see how characters could do that through food in the same way that I think people do that through right like the sort of notion that you can't disdain someone too much if you're cooking them a meal because you're giving them comfort and you're giving them pleasure and you're giving them nourishment and if you're giving me nourishment then that is an act of faith in a lot of ways in the same way that it's an act of faith to cook something for someone because you're trusting that they'll take it and that 
they won't malign you for it and that you know that it will ultimately become a part of them as part of you you're sharing with them and is going to become a part of them so trying to find different routes and avenues for characters to come together through the act of sharing a meal or the act of rejecting a meal was a question that I'm constantly circling around but it felt especially important to parse it for memorial because food is food in the book but also it is so many different routes of connecting or not for each of the characters yeah this is like beautiful like very scary vulnerability and intimacy yeah like, like yeah you no know, exactly that yeah that's like that's very lovely it's like just describing oh. <laughs> um, okay so david says hi brian i loved your work from the first story of yours i read in the new yorker i ran out and bought a lot immediately i love your voice as Kristen says but also the way you give your queer characters like poke hope Hoke deals with trauma, but the end gives him some stability. Happiness, question mark. Is that something you prioritize, giving characters hope? Thanks for your question, David. Yes, that is something that I prioritize. And I think that from, I don't know, I think the outset of like my working with and like sort of around fiction, and it was apparent to me that I wanted to write queer characters and queer relationships and queer narratives where the foundation of them was warmth and the possibility of comfort and the possibility of growth, right? Like writing queer narratives that were operating from a foundation of possibility as opposed to like what they didn't have or as opposed to like a reaction from heteropatriarchy, right? Like I wanted to write narratives in which characters were having those conversations, the conversations that they have and the revolutions that they sort of endure and undergo on their own terms, right? And I'm always more interested, just me, myself personally, as a consumer of narrative, whether it's on the screen or on the page, a more avid and more taken person when I come across narratives in which the characters are operating from a position of love for those around them, right? Like there's a way of writing narratives featuring queer folks where their queerness is a source of trauma and solely a source of trauma, or it is an obstacle that they have to overcome or they come out and then, you know, every door opens and right. you know, every application <laughs> is accepted and you know, they won the lotto and it's just the best fucking day. And that's, it is the you know, greatest. They give you the, all that good stuff right when you come out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no. Someone, someone asked me uh, the other day if like, uh, like, Writing memorial and like seeing it published was like a, a a byline within like the larger gay agenda. And I was like, oh my god, yeah. Like, <laughs> so it's like, it was just like, yeah, I, I just, I'm just a tool that it's being utilized for the larger cause. But yeah, I mean, it's really, I don't know, the, the giving characters the capacity of, of of and for hope and giving their narratives the capacity for hope feels indelible to not only what I'm trying to do, but also what I'm interested mm -hmm. in. And it doesn't bore me, you know? I think that there's a way in which writing narratives from the vantage point of kindness or warmth or hope or pleasure can sort of be frowned upon or like, deemed as sentimental by like the money people or like the folks who sort of determine like what is capital L contemporary American literature like in this particular country. But I think those narratives are very valid. And I think that they're particularly valid when they're featuring marginalized characters and more specifically marginalized characters that, that are queer. So it's something that's really important to me. Yeah. I, I love the idea of also like you were talking about place of hope. I just also am from a, a viewpoint of being like, right, as, as, as a queer person, I enjoy seeing just like, um, right, capital L literature, just fucking like lowercase L literature or like <laughs> a, me or I don't know, a, like a YouTube video. I want to see something that just looks like 
lived queer experience, which is often messy, sometimes yeah. hopeful, sometimes not. Like, I just want to see like a slice of life that includes like queerness in it. Like, because like, you know, we're queer and like, you know, like that's includes all like the messy spectrum of all of those different things, like including. Yeah. And I, I love the idea of like, right. Like there's just, I don't, I don't I don't know. Like the, there's this like kind of like preference for including like a trauma that has to do with queerness. And I just like, yes. I just feel like there's so much of that in the canon and I just like would like to shoot it out of the canon a little bit. <laughs> shoot <the> yeah, <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's that's exactly the thing. I mean, I think that there's a iteration of Memorial that exists in a parallel universe written by Brian with an eye where Benson is, you know, a character who, you know, he is a black and he's a cis male and he's also Paws and his HIV status is a massive, massive, massive sort of trauma and mm -hmm. a thing for him to overcome or to succumb to yeah. over the course of the narrative. And I wasn't interested in reading that, you know? I mean, I think that it had to be true that there could be a narrative where a character like Benson exists because the South is in the midst of an HIV epidemic among black men and have sex with men. And it could also be true that uh, a character like Benson has love and hope and fears and dislikes and things that he laughs. And writing a narrative in which each character had the benefit of the doubt and each character had humanity was I don't know how important to me because, you know, it's just like you said, like being like a queer person who like grew up sort of like willing queer narratives into virtually every narrative that mm -hmm. I came across, right? Like maybe if I like take this 50,000 word novel and take out every paragraph of threes three and then reorder them, it becomes like a queer <laughs> narrative. And you know, like <laughs> as someone who like sort of like willed, you know, those, those queer like <laughs> you know, kind of things that um, they had the chance to get to write some has been deeply gratifying. Yeah. Um, oh, there's so many good questions. I feel like we're gonna run out of time. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to this one. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This is Christopher. Brian, you said it started out as a short story and then expanded. What was the revision process for that like? How do you treat revision? And do you change up your approach based on the project's demands? This is a technical question, a craft question, Brian. A craft question, yes. craft question. So thank you, Christopher, for your craft question. Um, so I suppose what I'll say is that my process is pretty similar from medium to medium. Um, and that is partly because just like me, myself, like as a person, when it comes to crafting narrative, my attention span is very small. So regardless of whether I'm working with a longer project or a very short one, it looks really excerpty and it looks really bitty because I have the attention span of 2,500 words or so. And it is a great deal of strain for me to like extend that side of that. So if it's a 25,000 word thing, it is almost certainly going to be like 15 different sections made up of you know less than 3,000 words. So in that regard, the actual writing of it isn't different. But I think where there's significant variability is the questions that I'm looking to answer in that if a question looks like it can sustain the length of a short story, then that question will be proper there. And if it can sustain the length of a novella or if it can sustain the length of a novel, then that's where I'll sort of proffer it. Um, but as far as like Memorial is concerned, the actual drafting of it was roughly 11 drafts. Um, and one draft consisted of writing the first part, um, writing the second part, immediately editing the first and second in tandem with one another, then moving on to the third part, immediately editing the first, second and third parts with one another. And that composite process constituted a draft. Um, there were seven of those drafts that I did on my own, um, two more that I did with my agent and then two more that I did with my editor. It took roughly three years. So it was a lot, but it also felt like it had and really could have only been done that way because I needed 
to figure out who the characters were and I needed to figure out what their wants and needs and desires were. And in the same way that they changed over the course of the novel, they changed over the course of writing the novel because that felt true to them being people on the page. And I wouldn't have been able to realize that within the text, I don't think within a handful of drafts. So really giving myself the space to be conscientious about the characters and to allow them to have a thoughtfulness and a humanity um, takes a good deal of time and a good deal of drafting, a good deal of what could feel like overwriting, but in a lot of ways it's essential writing in order for me to figure out exactly what the characters are saying when they're saying the things that they do. Yeah. I mean, it's like essentially like you talking about like even the, the arc of the book and the shape of the book is like these characters like figuring out these things about themselves or like at least attempting to. So this like development yeah. of like relationships is you also like in tandem, you developing these relationships with these characters. Exactly. That's exactly it. That's fucking fascinating. Um, huh? yeah. <laughs> I know. I wish Sorry. you could call Sorry. me. <laughs> I could, oh, I could no. literally just pour myself another drink and sit and listen to you guys all night. Um, but we are out of time. Um, thank you both. I just loved like the nooks and crannies that you got into. It, it was really wonderful to listen to you. Everyone that's watching, buy a book, um, read a book. and oh, Buy two books. Buy, buy mostly yeah, dead things too. <laughs> buy a book, wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you both. Congratulations, Brian. Yeah, thank you.